everyone, Eric Watson here, freelance writer, player of games, writer of words, recorder of videos, and tabletop role-playing aficionado. Welcome to another DM's Guild review, my written and video review series where I take a look at the adventures and supplemental material at the Dungeon Masters Guild website. This video I'll be reviewing the DM's Guild supplement, Adaptable NPCs 2, designed by Grim Press, aka Trevor Armstrong and Jeffrey Fisher for Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. A review copy has been provided for the purposes of this review. If you enjoy my videos, consider using my affiliate links for your DMs Guild shopping and supporting me via patreon.com slash roguewatson. Shoutouts to Platinum Patrons Andrew, Joe, Will, Tiny Dancer, Nick, Andy, Chris, Alberto, Manuel, and Basil, and Gold Patrons RPG Papercrafts, Charming Grenade, Pretty Boy, Nima, Marcos, Dave, Vicente, Gilberto, Shane, K, Cert, to be Adam, Deathless, Lion, Sam, Arash, Lumpy Spuds, and Jerome. Thank you all very much for your support. I reviewed the first adaptable NPCs a little over a year ago. It was notable for having over 70 NPC stat blocks. And when I when I say NPC, I usually I picture specifically like that back end of the monster manual that, that lists humanoid. So like your guards, your mages, your bandits, your cultists. Those are all... I mean, I realize not NPC stands for non-player character and includes everything from monster to, you know, anything that's not a player character. But when I specifically think of... NPC versus monster, an NPC is usually a humanoid, or in other words, a kind of sentient, or somebody that's kind of built to where they're almost like a, a player, but at least not played by a player, so they kind of have play by the same like humanoid rules. And that's how Adaptable NPCs was designed, is it included more of those kinds of stat blocks, so specifically humanoid stat blocks, an expansion of that one section at the end of the monster manual, you would find all kinds of new uh, NPCs that you could just drop into any campaign and use, and they would include from, you know, pretty low CRs all the way to higher ones, although with an emphasis on lower in general, because again, we're focusing on, you know, basically humanoids, and most of them only get so high, except for player characters, which can become godly, of course. It also included a bunch of drop-in dungeons that utilize the new NPCs, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, I did have, I mean, you can go back and watch that review, certainly, and read it, uh, one of my complaints was that the dungeons were a little too hack and slashy, a little too straightforward, kind of like Diablo style dungeons, and that the art was basically just a bunch of deviant art, which, not to take away from what deviant art is, but it was almost like the designers uh, just were perusing through deviant art and then used that to make some new stat blocks, which is an interesting concept. A lot of the art, however, resulted in uh, like really just dark colors where it was really just hard to see what was going on, very muted palette, not an art style that I necessarily like. So I had um, mixed feelings, although generally still pretty positive on the first Adaptable NPCs. The sequel, basically the same thing. It's very much a sequel. It's got more NPCs, more dungeons, all done in that exact same style as the first one. This one features over 100 NPCs, which is nuts, and a dozen of those drop-in single-page dungeons that a lot of them utilize the new NPCs that are introduced. And I pretty much have my exact same commentary. Like, I think they, there's a good variety here. Um, generally, I'm thumbs up on this on all the NPCs that are introduced. There's a, there's some good ideas. There's a lot of familiar faces in here, uh, especially because if the first Adaptable NPCs was in response to the Monster Manual in the Player's Handbook in terms of a lot of them were just like NPC versions of player characters, uh, this one is in response to things from like Xanathars and, you know, Mordenkainen's and all the expansion stuff that we've since gotten, and this kind of expands on a lot of the NPCs that you see from there. For example, you'll see like the Gloomstalker and the Hexblade and the Undying Warlock, you know, very much just taken... NPC stat blocks from all these new uh, PC options that were added. We also do get some new ideas, which are fun. It actually expands a little bit beyond humanoid NPCs and includes a few um, undead and beasts and constructs and elementals, although that's very... There, there's only like a dozen of those or so out of the like, again, 100... I think it's 110 total uh, NPCs. So it's still mostly humanoids. And the idea here is... You know, some of them are designed as kind of quest givers that might have like a single ability you can do on a player or otherwise just, you know, here's an art you can use. Um, some of them are designed as party companions. They might have some good 
you know, buffs or helping stats or something along those lines. And then, of course, a lot of them are designed for uh, enemies. So there's a good combination there. And the drop-in dungeons do a pretty good job of mixing up and saying, hey, here's your quest-giving NPC that you could use. Here's your companion NPC that can join the party. And then here are the actual foes that you're trying to go after. And every single one of them, like the boss, is just one of these, you know, bigger foes. So we can scroll through and we can take a look at some of the ones that I thought were worth... Um, Highlighting, we've got, uh, and, and you can see the art style too. So the, the way it's designed, and again, this is exactly like the first adaptable NPCs. If you haven't looked at that one, this is pretty much the same thing, which is we get a huge piece of art, which is all from DeviantArt, uh, a nice stat block and some descriptions, which is basically all, you know, right out of the monster manual or any of the official 5e stuff. Like it's all done in that exact same style. So it looks good. The art is just very inconsistent as it is on DeviantArt. I mean, there's no, you know, it's just whatever people are, are making on there. So some of it, I think, is actually really, really good. Um, and some of it is just very, very dark and maybe even, like, low res and kind of hard to tell what's going on. One of my complaints from the first Adaptable NBCs was how all the uh, women characters were drawn in, like, you know, the very archaic, like, you know, boob armor and just ass hanging out and everything that's just... Pretty ridiculous for most character concepts, uh, enemies included. And this one kind of solves that problem by just not having very many women characters, so it's not actually a, a good solution. Like I didn't, I didn't go through and like count everything or anything like that. But most of the things in here are, are male, or at least male presenting. Uh, so technically, not a lot of like boob armor and stuff happening here. But on the other hand, there's just not a whole lot of like women art in general. I'm trying to find an example of something that was like really dark and hard to tell. Uh, what was going on? I mean, there's 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 some good stuff that I enjoyed, um, but it's the actual like okay, here's a good example like the Dark Rider and the Death Whisper. Like this is really dark, just kind of muddy art that it, I don't know if it's the way it was cropped, you know, to fit in here. You can tell these are all like maybe full page things originally, and they were all kind of set in it, which is I'm glad it was cropped and fit in. I, I do like the fact that they're all on a single page that looks nice from a presentation organization standpoint, but not all of the art looks, you know, particularly. Um, enjoyable from that standpoint. But we do get tokens, which is really cool. We get separate tokens for every single one of these NPCs if you're playing on a virtual tabletop, which is a huge plus. That's really, really cool to see. Um, let's see. So we skipped a couple that I actually liked. The Chain Demon. It has built into its stat blocks that it's actually chained to a floor with chains that have hit points and AC, but it does fire damage within 10 feet around it, so hopefully you're putting your players in a situation where they can't really get away from it much, but I think that's just thematically cool. One of the examples of a, a kind of silly one, the bungling burglar, is unlucky. He's got disadvantage on all of the things that he does, on all the skill checks. <laughs> Poor bungling burglar. Uh, let's see, 21, the crystal seer has the ability to essentially bestow a divine portent die on somebody. Uh, like the Divination Wizard, so that's pretty cool from an NPC standpoint. And that'd be a great thing to do for, like, an ally, uh, even though she's actually got some pretty decent spells, but she's thematically tied to, you know, Clairvoyance and Arcane Eye and Scrying, very specific skill set. But I just like the idea of a companion NPC or a quest-giving NPC being able to basically give somebody a portent die, which is pretty neat. Um, on the other end, excuse me, for an enemy, we've got the Depraved Queen, which is kind of a built-in Banshee, but she's also got a bunch of uh, Charming and Paralyzation spells. When she does her big scream, uh, they actually uh, she charms enemies that fail the saving throw, or another one, she can just knock them unconscious. Just a neat idea for uh, kind of a boss enemy, especially if you've got the right kind of minions along with her that could maybe take advantage of that. That's pretty cool. Uh, and yes, one of the dungeons at the end is uh, has her in it, although it's a neat dungeon design because it's like a role-playing, like Queen's Court kind of a deal where it's like a murder mystery. So I like that I, I like that idea quite a bit. Uh, there's Frigid Abyssal Walker, which is another one who's a boss at the end of one of the dungeons. Uh, this one, basically just a warlock with ice spells. And that's, you know, when you've got over 100 NPCs, not all these are going to be like super interesting and have unique abilities. A lot of times it's just thematic... Uh, versions of, you know, how a player character would create their person. So I think, like, an ice-themed warlock is a neat idea for any character concept, and this just takes that idea and, like, all right, what does a CR6 version of that look like? 
and it includes a few extra things. So you've got, you know, Abyssal Blast instead of Eldritch Blast, and Frigid Rebuke instead of Hellish Rebuke, which, again, all really neat ideas, and I think, you know, a lot of players would even try to theme it that way for their campaigns if they were actually playing this character, but... This works very well as an NPC also, or as a or as a boss enemy or something. So that's a I think that's a neat idea. And a lot of them are just like that. They're like, you know, just themed player characters that surround these kind of good ideas. But I will highlight some of the cooler one oh frozen <laughs> The Frozen White is straight up Arthas from Warcraft, which I don't really have a complaint about. That's a neat idea to take Arthas uh Arthas from the Warcraft series and turn him into a CR fourteen Enemy, complete with his sword, Frostborn Hungers. Uh, Frostmare, in this case. Uh, which is like a... Bo- he's kind of built like an Eldritch... Uh, I was going to say Eldritch Knight, but I guess he's got some Warlock abilities. You know, just, again, a neat idea. I wouldn't mind if it were... If the NPCs were more like this, honestly, just... Which I think was more in the case of the first adaptable NPCs, which is they took a lot of, you know, character classes from, like, JRPGs and stuff and made that into uh, NPCs. I wouldn't mind seeing more like this, where it was... Uh, widely known heroes and villains and just trying to create them as uh, almost generic NPCs with a kind of wink wink nudge nudge you know they're not trying to to hide it too much uh, you know he's even got that sentient <laughs> frozen sword and this is literally like fan fiction artwork of Arthas right here uh, I think that's a neat idea though especially if your characters if your players recognize that kind of thing if you've got like warcraft fans at the table and they slowly realize wait a minute we're just playing through the you know this is a part of the warcraft story or you know oh shit this is i found frostmorn and i think that's a neat idea i'm, I'm all for hitting up those kind of cliches and tropes uh that are fun in our tabletop rpgs uh herbalist is a good example of somebody who's got some extra abilities so they can use the um healing bandages and it just has a bunch of different effects you can give somebody resistance to fire or cold damage, um, advantage on saves against being poisoned, resistant to poison damage. You can have it so if they always regain the max number of hit points whenever they short rest and spend hit dice, uh, advantage on death saving throws. Just a neat idea for a companion NPC. And they have a lot of different options, which is always cool. And they can, as, a, as an attack, you can throw a poison vial. There's another one that's similar to this, which is the Plague Bearer, which is kind of the opposite spectrum which makes for a good uh, antagonist. And sure enough, as you can tell, a lot of my favorite ones, I I think maybe the designers also thought they were the best ones, and those are the ones that get their own dungeons uh, at the back of this book, which are, they're like the bosses of their own dungeons. And the Plague Bear is one of those. Uh, The Chained Demon was basically one of those. The Depraved Queen was one of those. The the Frigid Abyssal Walker was one of those. I'm I'm basically hitting up all the ones that, going through, I was just writing down the ones that I thought were the most interesting and cool. And then literally when I got to the back of the book and saw all the dungeons, all of the ones that I loved the most were the ones that were highlighted the most. So I don't think that's on accident. Uh, The Plague Bear is a cool ability where... Uh, he can throw a diseased vial at somebody, and it has all these different effects. I guess you could either roll like a, let's see, one, two, three. You could roll a 1d6, or you could just choose one of these. Although one of them is, after a long rest, you just, you're unconscious. You don't wake up. And every day that passes, you your hit points are halved, which is fucking terrifying. Compared to the others, which just deal like poison or necrotic damage or, you know, some, or petrification. Something that's a little more, uh, you can deal with it a little easier. That one's... That is a painful contagion. Um, the Mage Hunter is kind of a neat idea for going after high-level enemy spellcasters. A CR 16, by the way. Most of the NPCs in here, I, I kind of glossed over the by CR, but are Tier 1 and Tier 2, which makes sense. That's where most of D&D is being played, and that's where most of the time you're going to see and deal with a lot of humanoids as opposed to you know gigantic monsters that have extra things going for them. So it makes sense that they're mostly Tier 1 and Tier 2, but rarely we do get a few very specialized, heightened uh, humanoids that are in the higher range. The Mage Hunter is one of those. This dude has uh, attacks that cause... uh, that, that force you to make a con save, and you've got disadvantage. They have legendary resistance. They have a at will anti magic field in a 10 foot radius that they can turn off and on they have advantage on all saving throws against fifth level and they have a at will not at will i guess it's a reaction they can basically have built in counter spell and they also have legendary actions on top of that where they can do this cool like teleport move where they can teleport close it's just all these things are like designed to counter all of the of the wizard shit so i think that's a neat idea for a foe against you know say you've got a 
either a team of sorcerers or wizards, or this could be like, you could build this person as a specific, you know, you are being hunted by this person who's designed to take you out. And it reminds me of uh, the very, very excellent Broken Earth trilogy uh, by N.K. Jemisin, which is an absolutely phenomenal series of fantasy books. And one of them is the uh, protagonist is basically a, I won't spoil it, but it's basically a uh, sorcerer. And there are a whole, it's kind of like Dragon Age, where there's a whole uh, sect of, like, uh, mage guard, guardians that are designed to, like, keep the mages in check. Um, and it, it works very similar to this, where they have all these specific powers that can, like, shunt off what the mages can do. So it's it's a really cool system, and that's what reminded me of this one. I like, I like that a lot. Mage Hunter, I'll have to keep that one in my back pocket. Um, Rune Hunter was another cool idea. Which featured um, a, a rune. This reminds me of uh, Celeste from Final Fantasy VI, where they can absorb a spell that misses them, channel it into their sword, and then deal that much damage on their next turn. They can also scribe runes on themselves or others, and these runes have different effects, like plus five to an ability score, or resistance to a certain damage type, or um, built in uh, rebuke. Just cool ideas again. And I think that's pretty much all of the ones that I had highlighted. I mean, it's just, you know, Storm Knight had, is a knight with lightning powers. And a lot of them are like that. Again, a lot of them are just, you've got over a hundred NPCs. Most of them are just taking a concept and theming it in a certain way. And some of them are just goofy and, and simple. Uh, you know, a good example of one that doesn't really, isn't terribly impressive on paper, but still gives you different options is the Vagabond. The Vagabond is basically a spy, like the, literally the CR1 spy stat block. But instead of the bonus action disengage stuff, they have the ability to lay a trap three times a day. And the trap stats are all spelled out here, which is a neat idea. Notice how it has more armor class and like twice the hit points as a spy. And that's something you're going to find throughout uh, this supplement is that the hit points of most of these humanoids are a lot higher than what their equivalents would be in the monster manual. And I think that's very much on purpose because as anybody who's played any amount of D&D knows is that most of the monsters in the monster manual are too easy for their CR value. And even if you try to do the math of like making your own monster and, and doing that, it just doesn't really add up correctly. So I've got no problem with making these enemies a lot stronger, but that's something you should be aware of uh, when you're just dropping these in there, I don't know if these CR, I mean, combat balance is one of the most convoluted aspects of D and D design and five E balance. I think because it's not done very well in the original monster manual, their monsters are usually way easier than what they should be. So something to keep in mind, that's not a pro or con in here, but these enemies typically have a lot more, uh, hit points and kind of designed for more of the, I would say experienced players that enjoy combat and really enjoy the meat of it and want combat to last longer or be challenged. And not every uh, team necessarily, uh, not every uh, group necessarily wants to do that. So that is all of the NPCs. That's I just highlighted a few of my favorites, but there's a lot of um, good stuff there. At the end of the book, we get the Pathways for Adventure, which are 12 drop-in dungeons. Adaptable NPCs 1 came with 8. This one comes with 12. They all include their own maps and their own little uh, adventure breakdowns. Now, we get full-color battle maps, which is awesome. These are pretty cool maps, which is awesome. The actual adventure backgrounds are decently fine. Some of them have some cool ideas in there. And then the layout is pretty much just a straightforward hack and slash for the most part. Now, a couple of them do try to do something different. Most notably is the, um, the one I talked to, the Queen's Court, which mentions kind of a, uh, somebody, you know, you're invited to uh, this castle and everybody's having, I don't know if it's a party or a wedding or something's going on. And uh, there's a, a an assassination attempt made on the queen who's, who, who is a, a uh, what are the, a lady of the court in disguise no, sorry, a depraved queen. She's the depraved queen in, dis in disguise. She, she only does it at night, I guess. Turns into this banshee thing. And somebody in her court is trying to kill her, and the party's there, and it's kind of a murder mystery. But all of that is mentioned in, like, a single paragraph or two. You know, there's not, like, a timeline or dates or anything like that. So the structure of these dungeons never changes beyond, okay, here's your overarching synopsis. And then uh, here is maybe a single paragraph of description along with, like, the NPCs that we're using. And then here's just a room-by-room -room breakdown. And rooms either have 
nothing in them, they have treasure in them, or they have enemies in them. There's no real, like, there's no traps, there's no puzzles, um, there's no real... I don't think there's any, like, people you can find and talk to, although you do te typically get somebody in the beginning that joins you, so they could be an NPC that way. But they're all designed that same way, even though some of them do try to do something different and kind of play around with that, like this one, which at least attempts to tell a story about this assassination. But it's not really like a beginning, middle, end kind of story. These are very much just drop in, and a lot of them are just hack and slash. It's just, hey, you stumble upon this, you know, monastery in the middle of the cold, and there's a frigid abyssal walker in there. There's this temple full of, you know, undead roaming around, or there's this item that we need to get from uh, the swamps. Um, there's a horde of undead rampaging around this nearest town. We need to go into this cave and this kind of cool flooded grotto map and stop this hollow soul from praying at this altar, which is making all this happen. There, there is some good stuff going on here. It's just the actual dungeon designs aren't terribly impressive or inventive. Now, that's a weird complaint to have because this is not an adventure product. <laughs> all of this is just bonus. You know, that this is, this is designed as just a bunch of NPCs a lot of NPC stat blocks that you can drop into your campaign and utilize. The fact that we get all of these battle maps, all of these dungeons, all of these tokens, and yes, we do get separate maps for player and DM. Obviously, you're looking at the embedded version of the DM player map. The supplement does include separate player battle maps with all the numbers and things. The fact that we get all of that in this is absolutely incredible. So, yes, I'm complaining a bit about the dungeon design. I... I just wish, you know, I, I like the single page thing, and I like the fact that a lot of them use the NPCs that are provided. I just wish it had gone just a little bit further and done a few, because there's a way you can just do, hey, this this tunnel right here has collapsed. It'll fall unless you make a, this kind of saving throw, or, you know, there's a locked chest with a poison needle trap in there. Like, just a few of those would have really gone a long way to break up the action of just moving, looking around, moving, looking around, fight, move, fight, look around, fight, move. That's pretty much all you do in all of these different dungeons. So I think it goes a long way if you could include a few puzzles, a few secrets, a few lore notes. Uh, have a, a couple of them have like an NPC that you can find that's got some information or that they can actually meet halfway in the dungeon rather than always getting the NPC, you know, at the beginning of the dungeon to go through with them. There's a few things you can do without having to necessarily make these into big adventures and even try to keep the single page design but still insert a little bit more variety is what I would re really would have liked to have seen. But even so, I think it's awesome that we get these. I think these dungeons are uh, even more interesting and more varied than the ones in the first adaptable NPCs. They do a good job of, for the most part, showing off all the new NPCs that are added, although some of them are really just... Like this one, the Abyssal Frozen Walker basically just has that one guy in here as the boss, and all the rest are just, um, you know, whites and mimics and frocks and stuff. It's just some of them don't quite use a whole bunch of uh, of the humanoids. You'd, you'd think it'd be more, I don't know, like urban and cityscape, or but a lot of them still just kind of do the same caves and things. This is a neat like angel versus demon ones with a chasm right in the middle. I mean, they're they're cool maps and they're neat ideas, but ultimately it's just going room to room and and doing battles. So. Maybe not quite as uh, not quite as interesting as they could have been. All right, let's go over my pros and cons for adaptable NPCs to NPC Boogaloo. Over a hundred NPC stat blocks with art and tokens for virtual tabletops. Super mega thumbs up for that. Love to see it. Uh, pro huge variety of styles, including silly like the bungling burglar and the aging hero, familiar like the gloom stalker and the hexblade, and original like the crystal seer and the plague bearer. You will find all kind. I mean, with over a hundred, you're gonna find a lot of options. Everything from simple themed versions of player characters to really kind of cool ideas for companions and enemies to just kind of silly like there's a dignitary like just kind of silly stuff that you maybe use as a one-off. Pro 12 drop-in single-page dungeons with full-color battle maps that utilize the new NPCs. Very, very cool. And Pro separate DM and player battle maps. I wanted to highlight that specifically because if they had just done that and just included, you know, those maps as an example, you know, that's fine, but then I couldn't actually use that map. So I do like that the extra steps were taken to actually provide in separate zip files along with the tokens. We get those separate maps. So very VTT friendly, which I am a huge fan of. Cons... 
I really wrestled with including the art because I did include the art as a con in the first one, but this time around, I didn't because I think the art is better. It's a little more varied. There's still a lot of the art that I'm not a fan of, and overall, I'm not necessarily a fan of just going through deviant art and and picking art from there as as a style. But the art is I enjoyed the art more than I did with the first one. So ultimately, I had mixed feelings about it, which means I did not put it as a con. What I did put as a con were that the dungeons still, as is the was the case in the first adapt- adaptable NPCs, still very straightforward uh, and very hack and slashy. It's like a Diablo dungeon. You just it's just got some loot in it and some enemies and go for it. Even though it tries to do a few things like with the Queen's Court where it has this kind of murder mystery, but it doesn't really expand on like how that works. It really wants to keep it to that very simple, straightforward single page format. And I think there's ways that you can you can expand that and work around that. Final Verdict Adaptable NPCs 2 features even more interesting NPC stat blocks and fun drop-in dungeons to complement any D&D campaign. Thank you to everyone for watching this video review. You can see my written review at roguewatson.com. You can support my work at patreon.com slash roguewatson. And you can follow our own D&D adventures here on my YouTube channel. Thank you.